Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. I am going to speak quickly, and hopefully uh, everyone can keep up. I like to say, put on your seatbelt, because we have many slides uh, to bombard your mind and expand it of what's happening in the world of gold and royalty companies, and what's happening also, I'm gonna relate uh, the millennials and how this sort of unprecedented um, event that's taken place during the corona lockdown and the stock markets fell and all of a sudden this wave of new investors are coming in which i think is very exciting uh long term for investors because we've really not seen that ecosystem expand since the uh, 90s when we had the last tech boom so let's talk about precious metal royalty companies and streaming and how they impact as you know i'm so often quoted uh in various publications and it's always funny you know on cnbc uh, New York, it's it's usually defending the thesis of gold as an asset class uh, because it's sort of a you know anti uh, gold phenomena that takes place with most of the talking heads there. Um, whereas on Fox News, um, since we were always known for gold, they love to talk about the royalty companies, uh, and that's something we've advocated on why they're special. And this is another visual of, of global trotting um, all over the world on a regular basis, except for the past couple of months uh, being sort of stationed here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I travel all over the world and that led to the creation of an ETF in the airline industry five years ago, which relates to this whole phenomena of new investors, which I think will also benefit in the junior mining space. Uh, but I just thought, uh, I'll try to highlight this sort of global travel. But what is interesting to me and for you is that I always get this pushback of, of New York uh, City in particular, uh, media, big media platforms on gold. It's a risky asset class. Gold is a bad asset class. And, and when you look back since the year 2000, gold has been up 80% of the time. I mean, that's a big, incredible batting average and only 20% of the time. And every time it starts to take off, oh, it's gone too far. And every time it falls, it's, I told you so, it'll, it's going to crash, crash. It doesn't. It's a resilient, it's an important asset class. And I hope that I can walk you through some of the reasons. So what drives gold and what drives the demand for gold? There's two drivers. And I try to simplify, there's the fear trade which dominates the media today, but there's also the love trade. And the love trade's very, very important because it's about 60% of demand. And it's important what takes place in particular when we go to Asia and the Middle East and India, uh, just massive cultural affinity towards gold as an asset class. And the same as icon we have in America, the king of rock and roll in his famous gold suit. The only other person I've known that's worn a gold jacket like that for receiving major awards is Pierre Lasson and Seymour Schulich, the creators of Franco Nevada, the first true royalty company, which we'll delve into in a few minutes. But now what drives the fear trade? The fear trade is driven by government policies. And whenever there's a big imbalance between monetary and fiscal policies, then gold starts to get exciting and you start to see gold becoming more of a mainstream asset class. And so it's a simple binomial model. Government policy is either monetary or fiscal, as you can see. And that bifurcates into real interest rates and money supply and in tax and regulation and spending. And the coronavirus has totally disrupted this. It's unprecedented that we would have zero interest rates. And, and so like unbelievable growth in money supply not just in our country in America, but all over the world. And fiscal policies now to fight the coronavirus is this huge budget spending. So how will this unravel? Gold is percolating as an important asset class. So I like to go through some case studies to try to amplify this fear trade to understand how it's captivating the, the talking heads now. So U.S. debt is now more than 121% of the U.S. economy in 2020. And you can see what's important here is the huge increase in the Federal Reserve balance sheet and the U.S. Treasury debt, particularly when Trump locked down all global travel. Uh, and that was in mid-March. So this expansion allows you to sort of 
guesstimate where will the economy be, where will gold be? Because if we go back to 2008, 2009, next slide, please. And this is going back into the, the visual, what happened after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and the crisis of 2008 going into nine, there was a substantial increase in the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And that led to three years later, the price of gold hovered between 700 and 800, basically elevate to $1,900. Uh, and I think if you take a look at the amount of trillions of dollars being spent today in the US alone, this excludes Europe, this excludes Japan, excludes China and other nations around the world. It's easy and comfortable to forecast $4,000 an ounce over the next uh, three years. Uh, now, not every cycle always repeats itself exactly, but this is very, very different as we're going into uh, this unprecedented debt. Now, the other part is this interesting is that a lot of countries like Switzerland, Japan, they float a bond and they say, well, let's go raise a billion dollars and the public only buys 100 million. So the government themselves buy the 900 million and they basically print this funny money at a zero interest rate and then they go and buy stocks. So if you take a look today, the Swiss Central Bank is a big shareholder of Apple and other major corporations. They own 15% of their own stock market. So we're seeing some of this money come back into the stock market, which is trying to explain where the unprecedented levels are. In Japan, they use the ETF, and I believe they own close to 15% of the Japanese market through. So there's a new unprecedented changes that are taking place in the formation of capital. So I think that gold can easily surge to $4,000 based on these cycles. Next, please. So this is that visual of showing you that uh, how it could and why you can see 4,000. It's not irrational forecast. Uh, and the other part is that it took about $3 trillion in 2008, 2009 with the federal balance sheet expanding. Uh, this is gonna take about $10 trillion. So when we see this take place, and differently than other cycles, it's zero interest rates. And in many countries, negative real interest rates. Next, please. So what started happening about 18 months ago and has grown, uh, are these billionaire hedge fund managers that started talking about gold. Sam Zell, known for his real estate, uh, last year started buying gold in the spring and was became a regular talking person on Bloomberg and CNBC uh, for the money printing that was taking place before the coronavirus took off, before the huge explosion. And then we've had Stanley Druckenmiller used to be with George Soros, another big advocate of gold, and uh, Paul Tudor Jones, another big advocate of gold. And he's also been buying this year Bitcoin. Uh, which is interesting. Whereas Ray Dalio, he's the most important. And if you've not watched his YouTube videos uh, on how the economy works, they're free and I highly recommend you listen to him and explain how he views the economy. He is the 800 pound gorilla. He is the biggest hedge fund in the world. Uh, and he's always had a, a cultural affinity for his own heart towards gold as an asset class. Uh, and he has between 10 and 15% in bullion and stocks and a lot of the royalty companies. Next, please. So I always hear about Warren Buffett and, and I try to remind investors, he hasn't always been right. He's been negative on the airlines, he's been negative on Bitcoin. He admits that he missed Amazon and Google and he's just human. Uh, and I think the whole recent uh, expose on him of missing the, the airlines for argument's sake of having $10 billion and then divesting is to remember he turns 90 this year. You know, the median age of people dying from coronavirus is 82. He's very sensitive over that. Next, please. So Berkshire Hathaway versus gold. Going back to the year 2000, gold is bullion has outperformed Berkshire Hathaway. That's just an important argument that I like to use when I hear people all of a sudden being so negative on the uh, on, on bullion and the stock market so bullish on 
just recognize that Bullion has been an incredible performer as, as each cycle we've had is more government intervention, more synchronized taxation and regulation with the G G20 finance ministers, and gold continues to perform this year. Next, please. And this is one of my other favorites is Franco Nevada, uh, the premier royalty company, the first royalty company. I was so blessed to be able to work on as a young uh, corporate finance uh, a banker in Toronto in, in 1983, I'm taking it public. It went private, it was merged in with Newmont, and then 2008, it went public again. And so when you take a look at Newmont, and uh, not Newmont, but uh, take a look at Newmont versus Franco Nevada, Franco Nevada has outperformed Newmont. Further, more important in this whole thesis is Franco Nevada's far outperformed Berkshire Hathaway since 2010. And in fact, all through the 80s and 90s, they'd outperform. It's a superior business model of the royalty companies. And it just, this is a classic example. It has a moat around it, like Buffett likes to talk about. And it has high revenue per employee, we'll talk about in a second. But look at this outer performance of Nevada versus Berkshire Hathaway. Next, please. Well, an important part on the supply and demand factors is this case study on peak gold supply. And basically, it's peaking or peaked. Uh, and unlike fracking, it uh, was a game changer for the oil and gas industry in 2008-2009, that oil has never gone above $100 a barrel and remains under supply pressure. Uh, there's nothing that's happening in gold. So I think the supply of gold has continued to drop from mine production, and over time this will be very bullish as another factor for driving higher gold prices. So let's look at palladium, what happened with palladium. Next slide, please. So what we see in this visual is that the supply of palladium, this is using ETFs, but also supply from mines started dropping in 2015. And it was accelerated because of the Volkswagen scandal on platinum and catalytic converters, et cetera. And palladium demand started to grow. At the same time, supply started to fall. And then all of a sudden you see a huge takeoff in palladium prices. It went from 1000 to $2,700 in a year, basically, and, and no one could understand why. This is a classic example, another reason why gold could easily run to 4000 or much higher. Next, please. So the royalty business model is they basically fund exploration and production, expansion for miners and return for royalties and streams on what it produces. Next, please. What we see that makes them so attractive is that if they advance $100 million for uh, uh, 6 million ounces of gold, for simplicity, to develop that mine, and all of a sudden, after 10 years, that mine has found another 6 million ounces, and it expands its production, it's a free ride for the royalty companies. And that's where the excitement is, because when you look back in history, Franco Nevada has a royalty on Newmont and Barracks operations in Nevada. And when they first did that deal, it was only a couple million ounces. And now they produce 20 million ounces. All that became a free ride on that royalty. So I think it's an important part of a, a long term optionality on gold. Uh, and then they hold a diversified portfolio of junior mining companies. And I've found that when they put a royalty on a company, a junior mining company, it makes much more interesting for me because their due diligence of all their technical people before they'll take that, that risk is they've kicked the tires up in every angle you can think of <clears throat> before they take that risk. So that's usually a good sign. And then they have high revenue per employee compared to mining companies and much lower operating co costs. A classic example would be Franco Nevada will say they're doing 500 million in revenue and their GNA is 50 million. They have four, <clears throat> 450 million dollars of basic free cash flow to expand by other royalties, et cetera. That's like a technology company. And it's also like a SaaS revenue. And SaaS revenue companies always have, because of recurring revenue like Microsoft, they have the ability to get a much higher multiple on the revenue cash flow than a normal company. Next, please. When we take a look at performance, this is a classic example of looking at Wheaton River, Royal Gold, and Franco Nevada as, as a, the three amigos as a combined. Take a look <clears throat> since 2009, 
how they perform. Well, the GDXJs lost 39% of your money. Uh, uh, the big cap uh, oil uh, gold stocks, uh, they're up, uh, basically, they're minus 19%, and gold prices is up 59%, whereas the royalty companies are up 400%. So the royalty companies are an important part of a portfolio and something I've always advocated. Uh, and it isn't the junior mining, new explorers, uh, uh, they're very important for the ecology and for we need to find new reserves. I think uh, royalty companies play a basic role. Next, please. Well, it's another way of looking over three years. As you can see, the wheat uh, brushes basically went through a big battle with the with the tax authorities in Canada. They prevailed. They won, and all of a sudden there was a reset uh, on their on their growth profile. Uh, Franco Nevada, and you can see uh, still doesn't matter. All the royalty companies have done well. Next, please. Well, a key factor is called the efficiency ratio. Is the ratio is the revenue per employee, and when you look at, I said Franco Nevada, twenty-four million dollars of revenue per employee. Goldman Sachs is a million, and and when we look at Newmont and Barrick. Uh, it's a huge multiple. So they're much more efficient with their, and, and highly much more productive, and that allows them to be able to take free cash flow to buy new royalties or increase their dividends, and that's what they've been doing. I think in the first quarter, these three um, amigos here had free cash flow collectively of almost a half a billion dollars. Next, please. And many of the royalty companies have little or no debt. As you can see, uh, it's just a minimus. Franco Nevada zero, Royal Gold five percent, Wheaton fourteen. But then you go and buy, look at Barrick and Newmont. They're at seventeen and thirty. And Barrick used to have much more debt, and now it's basically they've been restructuring itself so that they now articulate that they're free cash flow. Interesting enough is that Newmont and Barrick are almost thirty percent of the GDX index of big caps, and because of the free cash flow, the quant funds are buying them. Next, please. So many royalty companies have little or no debt. And, and I think what's important here is uh, when we take a look at Kirkland Lake, who Franco Nevada has a royalty on. And I think when we look at this, you can see the spectacular uh, run and the revenue per share growth was a key investment in the growth of this. So that's the same factor that hits the royalty companies. Next, please. Each asset class has its own DNA of volatility. And what's important here is the GDXJ is predominantly the junior mining stocks. And there's been such wasted stock, uh, share issuances uh, that never deliver growth, growth in reserves or production or cash flow. And so they've really underperformed, but their volatility is spectacularly great. It's plus or minus 4% in any one day versus billion is 1% and the S&P is a little bit like 1%. And we can look at 10 days. So every asset class has its own DNA, like each of us do, of volatility. We all have different heights, different fingerprints, same with asset classes. So when you look at gold stocks, you just must be able to stomach that volatility and understand it and use it to your benefit, not become fearful of it. Next, please. So what I worked on in the interest of seeing new non-gold fund buyers coming into the capital markets, they're quant funds. And quant funds today are pushing close to 90% of all trading. And it's not just high frequency um, uh, trading, but it's high frequency research. And it's basically all of the movie Moneyball, with Brad Pitt was featured on, and now we're seeing every major sports team uses data sciences. And what we saw was the quant funds are looking for factors like growth and revenue per share, cash flow per share on a per share basis. So if two companies merge and the resultant new entity, the revenue doesn't increase on a per share basis. It gets, it basically goes in a penalty box. So I want to focus on an ETF that would basically be quant driven and the back testing on it worked out spectacularly well. We went back a long period in this quant world. Uh, everything is changing, like 40% of all trading now is coming through uh, Citadel Capital, that they basically drive that flow. 
uh, and it's recognizing how quants of change bid ask information flow. They can read a 10K in one minute. They can read a sentiment. Uh, President Trump talks negative of, about Sony or Mexican peso. Within one second, they're looking to go short. If he talks bullish about uh, an airline stock, then all of a sudden buying comes into it. Uh, so sentiment quant analysis has become very important. Uh, we're also seeing it how they look at these fundamental factors such as growth in revenue and cash flow per share. So the capital markets have changed substantially. And so what we said, okay, how, do, how can we capture that? So we created this, this ETF that's quant driven and 30% of the three big royalty companies and the rest of the stocks go down to $200 million market cap and they change each quarter. And basically, any silly mergers, uh, anything that destroys the revenue per share, production per share, or cash flow per share, uh, high returns on invested capital, they're gone. Uh, they're out. And and so that has outperformed the GDXJ. Uh, and back testing was like 92% of the time. And since we launched it three years ago, it's done exactly that. So I, I think it's important that you understand the business model like the royalty companies because it's a superior business model. And then when you start going and buying smaller cap gold stocks that you really understand the importance of companies raising money and they're actually finding those reserves per share and there's per share growth because our back testing on those, they outperform. Uh, and that's what investors are looking for, a value proposition. So that is basically the structure of what we created when we created this GoEU, this is a New York Stock Exchange ETF. Next, please. So what's happened is a really important phenomenon is over 3 million new traders since March have come in because they're bored and locked, locked in. Well, it's really interesting that to how many have turned to Robinhood. I remember um, um, TD Waterhouse and to Schwab announcing that they opened in March 600,000 new online customers each. And, but Robinhood opened up for free trading a uh, million. And so we're seeing that the sort of change of the Robinhood investors is similar to sports bettors between 25 and 34, but they're also much more savvy of how they look at stocks and rotations and sectors. Uh, they're more they're more internet driven and they get most of their information from youtube and webcasts like this and podcasts next please they're not going to the merrill lynch broker and asking for information so this is the data that you can get from a robin hood which i think uh, accounts how holding the gld and by the way robin hood is the only website that has a toolbar on it that has gold as an asset class the Schwab's, TD, Merrill Lynch's, none of them have that. You have to navigate through those things to find anything about gold stocks, but not Robinhood. Uh, and though this is a classic of showing over the past two years, as uh, the spider bullion ETF has been rising and, and flows have been going into it, so have the number of shareholders from Robinhood. Next, please. And, and go AU, it's the same thing. We're witnessing a growth uh, in those shareholders from 50 shareholders uh, two years ago to 300, almost 400 uh, new shareholders coming into uh, GoAU. And where we've had incredible growth is uh, in the Jets ETF, where it's basically gone from only a few hundred to almost 40,000 during this period. Uh, and, and so what we found is that a lot of these millennial smart traders look at previous cycles. And we saw in the airlines industry uh, went up 80% uh, after 9/11, went up 120% in Asia after the after the SARS uh, pandemic in Asia, and then went up uh, another 80% after the crisis of 2000-2009. Now, naturally, past performance don't guarantee a future results, but over a six-month run, that's a pretty good betting average. And uh, the first big run, they got most of that move. Uh, failed out. So you are going to see this happening in gold and we're going to see it happen in junior mining also. So there's something that's happening in the capital markets uh, that is just brand new. It's unfolding and I'm, I'm excited about being part of it. Next, please. So that's the jets showing you the skyrocketing uh, of, uh, of shareholders coming in from Robinhood. Next, please. 
And that is a wrap with disclosure. Uh, just remember, as I said, these previous cycles, they're not always the same. Uh, they're just mathematical bets. And it's better to have that perspective before you speculate. Uh, and if you go into an exploration company, you can make 10 times your money. But you have to you know there's luck a lot with that. Uh, track record of management, uh, they have the cash uh, to be able to get the types of performance, but they're also very risky and their DNA of volatility is much greater than what I showed earlier in the presentations of bullion versus gold stocks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And you mentioned that um, gold and um, gold investments, especially for millennials, will be a nice opportunity because of the risk factors and maybe uh, millennials wanting to in invest more in the long term um, than other generations. Can you elaborate on that, please? Well, it appears um, that it, it would happen in the 90s as there's more speculative money started coming into play, the tech boom. And you saw this after 95. And we're seeing that coming here also. Uh, and, and we've not seen the big overflow yet into the junior mining sector. Uh, what's interesting to me was that when Bitcoin took off from 3,000 to 19,000 before its massive uh, correction, we had a lot of millennials trading out their Bitcoin and buying cryptocurrencies. And there was about five billion dollars of speculative money went back into these new coins. That's all gone. And uh, and, and, and a lot of the, the millennials over participate in the stock market. We're now seeing them um, into the stock market. I think uh, they're going to look for more speculative ventures where they can make huge returns. But it's important is to realize there's lots of risk with that. Thank you, Frank. Um, this is a question for Frank and Joe. Maybe we'll start with Frank and then we'll pass on to Joe. Um, in your view, how has the royalty model evolved in the last five years? Is that for Joe or for me? Uh, we will start with you, Frank, and then I'll, I'll, we'll ask the same question to Joe. Well, what's interesting for me is that several times when I was speaking at conferences, uh, and some of the newsletter writers and uh, uh, money executives were trash talking uh, royalty companies and they hurt the and our math says this is not true uh actually when like i said it's a good housekeeping seal but what's happened now is many of them newsletter writers etc are recommending new royalty companies and there are new ones that have shown up and they've had spectacular performance coming from 10 million dollar ideas to 150 million dollar market caps so i i think we're going to see uh, more competition uh, in that junior space. And that's another way and mechanism to raise money for exploration. Uh, Joe? Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, royalty companies. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the big changes is Franco Nevada was mostly all about royalties and didn't do a lot of streams. Whereas these new companies came on like Wheaton and Sandstorm did a lot of streaming and streaming is different than royalties, but most tend to package that together. Franco, I would say would be more pure royalty than streaming. Sandstorm evolved originally as a streaming company but they tend to acquire royalties uh, as they can. What we've seen with the new companies, uh, uh, you know, there's been three or four of them that have IPO'd. Uh, what tends to happen is they pick up a portfolio from a company, either it's been Pan American, it might be Newmont, and another company picked up a, a package of royalties from or Orion, so Orion uh, Mine Finance. And so when you get a hold of this company and you're an investor, what you also got to look at liquidity is because sometimes these companies end up owning a significant chunk of the company and might not trade as well as a Franco or a Wheaton or a Sandstorm even that's already gone and is a bit more mature than the, than the younger ones. And very valid points. And, and I think what's interesting is that uh, like the CEO of uh, Almost Gold told me that he had $8 million uh, uh, royalties on his balance sheet he wasn't getting any reward for them and so he flipped them into a royalty company a junior royalty company and all of a sudden his valuations is eight million is seen each quarter and it's grown 300 percent so he's yeah. a happy camper yamana has done it also uh, so I, I think there's a this is the formation of capital is, is very creative how it's morphing here 
um, I mean, the other thing about that is that these uh, uh, royalty companies, their cost of capital is very low. And so when they pick up these royalties, that's all they're about. Uh, you know, and whatever cash flow they generate is discounted at a much lower rate than a mining company because uh, there is this uh, inherent, uh, uh, like, less risk, uh, you know, more diverse portfolio, hopefully. And so, uh, uh, and, and like Frank said, uh, when you take it out of a Pan American or a tech, which Sandstorm bought, uh, they don't get any value for it. They take a stake in the company and then uh, like Pan American just did, I believe with Mavericks, they sold uh, a, a bit of shares and uh, they made money off of it. Right. Thank you. Uh, so the next question also for Frank and Joe, um, we'll start with Frank and continue with Joe. Uh, for many investors in the audience, it will be the first time they're hearing about royalty companies. So would you be able to give us maybe a checklist or some guidelines on how to evaluate new companies to start following or investing in in their royalty space? Well, one of the biggest things we've seen, um, you know, as a screen, uh, it's, it's very quick to see is the revenue per employee and uh, their margins. So uh, we FactSet draws out and looks at their cash flow returns on invested capital. The industry of the 100 global gold producers we follow uh, have about 15% uh, is the median re cash flow return on invested capital. The royalty companies have 45% uh, or higher. So that's an important factor if a company says, oh, we're a royalty company, uh, that cash flow return on invested capital should be substantially higher than the median for just pure uh, gold mining producers. Sorry, uh, uh, could you ask the question again? Sorry. <laughs> sure, Joe. So, um, if you were to give some guidelines, or how how do you evaluate um, royalty companies for someone that is just starting to to invest in the space and is maybe overwhelmed by the amount of royalty companies out there? Um, what kind of things should they be looking at? Um, yeah, I would I would say uh, uh, one is, is trading liquidity. Uh, when these new ones start, look at how much actual volume there is to trade. The other thing was to just take a look at their assets. Uh, you know, how much do they generate from where is the asset? So even though they may look diversified, maybe 80% of the revenue comes from one asset. So uh, you'd have to check to see if that diversification, that low risk that they're getting in the market is actually real. Uh, and uh, those are more so for the new ones than the ones that have evolved. Uh, and then how much of their portfolio is actually cash flowing and how much is it about growth? If you believe in the growth, that's okay. If you don't believe in the growth, you shouldn't want to pay for it. So, so those are the sort of things you want to look for right now. But uh, definitely there's a there's an idea that if you go from, you know, ETF, low risk, you know, but, uh, you know, no dividends uh, to major companies or royalty companies, when you start getting to these new ones that are coming out, then you have to look at what portfolio that they actually get and how good are those assets? Is there any chance that those assets will actually, you know, end soon? You know, does that royalty only end in three years or does it have a long mine life? And, and before, we also had the issue about when people have royalties, they would have the royalty around the plant or a property, such that if somebody found something outside it, their royalty or stream wouldn't apply. And so that's a little bit of digging into the details, especially on the ones that are really exposed to one or two assets. Okay, very good point. And a classic video, Cisco, remember Cisco Royalty came out and they bought Orion, Orion's assets to get their revenue if you take a look at that royalty model and then they turn around and made an acquisition that diluted all of that and immediately their stock fell uh and they were now going to go into mining and uh, to develop a mine and take that cash well it didn't help their performance as a stock so i think uh, one has to be really cautious of regarding uh for me the simple rule has been their margins and revenue per employee is really, they may have in their name, their royalty company, but really that's not the substance. It's just form. And I remember Rick Rule years ago said, uh, when they had the big uranium boom, that there was more uranium in junior mining names than there was uranium assets in their companies. 
So I think we have to be so careful. Uh, of when a company tries a junior mining company says royalty in their name, they don't have royalties. Thank you both, Frank and Joe. Um, Patty, the next question will be for you, um, talking about new royalty companies and what is important in looking at um, at companies when doing our due diligence as investors. Um, you are the president and CEO of Evrim Resources. Um, you, we, you usually, or I mean, you recently announced a merger between Evrim and Renaissance Gold and becoming an organic royalty generator. Can you tell us a little more about what that means and how this model would be different or compared to the regular uh, royalty companies out there? Sure, sir. Thanks, Liliana. Um, yes, um, both uh, Everman and, and Renaissance uh, recently announced a, a merger to form a new royalty company called Origin uh, Royalties. And both companies uh, in their you know, prior form are prospect generators. And uh, our model has historically been to partner up with um, good quality exploration mining companies uh, to explore our ground and, and we retain either an equity interest or some form of royalty interest in the projects. And for both companies, we crystallized royalties on two of our key assets in the case of, of, of uh, Everm, it was the Ermitano deposit and in the case of Renaissance, it, it was the Silicon project. And so that created the opportunity to form this into a, a new royalty company. And so, you know, that being said, to, to answer your, your question a bit more succinctly, I think the biggest difference is that, <clears throat> that Origin will take over some of the other smaller, t smaller royalty companies that are out there um, really comes down to a two-pronged approach of how we acquire and buy royalties, but also how we organically generate royalties. And I think that the key differentiator here is through the organic royalty generation. Um, it speaks to our roots as a prospect generator. We are, are, are boots on the ground type of people. Um, we have explored in some of the, the, the best mineral belts in North America from uh, the Great Basin and uh, the Carlin Trend in, into the Laramide belts and the gold belts of Mexico and also up into uh, Northwestern British Columbia. And so that gives us an advantage, I think, over a lot of the other companies who might more focus on um, you know, standard uh, just the M&A practice of, of acquiring baskets of royalties, we will go out and organically generate these things on our own and um, we will continue to do so. And so the style of deals that we will employ going forward will be more for royalty creation um, and do that as much as we possibly can. Um, if you look at sort of the value creation that you get from organic royalty creation, it, it's, it's probably the most elegant uh, form of, of royalty generation and the, and the best form of value creation there is. Both Ermitano and Silicon, the value the, or the cost of those things were negligible compared to what those, the value has, has created today. So that's one key aspect of how we are going to be different in, in this you know, somewhat competitive space. I think the other aspect too is that where a lot of the companies today will go out and buy a basket of royalties with the hopes that, that one of those royalties may come to fruition, we will take a fairly measured and focused approach on which royalties to pick up. So it's going to focus a bit more on quality over quantity. And again, it speaks to our roots um, as explorationists working in those jurisdictions that we're very familiar in uh, with our ears to the ground and our boots on the ground. Um, to be able to pick up uh, royalties on, on a fairly cost-effective basis. Thank you, Patty. Um, are you hearing some echo? No. Okay. Um, for Frank and Joe, um, Patty was mentioning the jurisdictions um, for specifically for Evram. Do you have any any favorite jurisdiction for projects for royalty companies to pick up or um, maybe you don't have any preference? And maybe we can go with Joe first and then Frank. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, the question was uh, jurisdiction. It, it would depend. If it's a big diversified portfolio, jurisdiction matters less. And how much that geopolitical risk of that royalty fits into the overall portfolio 
it doesn't matter as much. But if you've got 50% of your valuation tied up with one royalty or stream or something that's in a jurisdiction people might not uh, like, then it's more of an issue. Um, personally, I mean, uh, uh, what I've seen is uh, when, when people have a diversified portfolio, uh, investors care less about where each individual royalty comes from. Uh, they're just looking for value, and it's not like everyone's discounting each royalty at a different rate. Everything comes in at the same rate. So the valuation's about the same, unless it sticks out like a sore thumb. I agree. All good. Okay, perfect. I think we're going to continue and move to the questions that we have received during the session. Um, we have someone asking, do you think the mid-tier gold royalty companies offer better upside than the big three? Um, that will be for Frank. Do I think what? Do you think that the mid-tier gold royalty companies offer a better upside than the big three? You know, it's, that, that's, a, that's a tough uh, question because the mid-tiers go in these incredible spurts. Um, and it's much more speculative money. It's like a warrant. Uh, the sandstorms are like a warrant on the big three. Uh, and so we do get a run in gold. Sandstorm will perform because it's that, that ability for it. But I think when you look at revenue per share, cash flow per share, uh, free cash flow, uh, the, the big three are in a much stronger position of how they manage themselves for that. And, and what happens in the big three is that is it the, they call the quality of the income. It's less volatile than new, Franco Nevada's revenue model is less volatile than Newmont's. Uh, their cash flow is less volatile. And, and so the longer they have that, the quants look at that and therefore it becomes for them a less risky play. They call that quality of earnings, quality of cash flow. And there's a huge audience of non-gold buyers that come in to look for those stocks. Um, you know, Cisco's, the Sandstorms, um, it, it's different. Now, I think there's some of the new ones like the Metallica, you know, I, I think they're really interesting what their, their business model is. And, uh, and they have a three guys that are running that. So I, I think uh, they have a lot of upside potential, but that's a more speculative place still. Thank you, friend. Um, the next question is, Miners and metals plunged in March with general market crash due to margin calls. And I suppose would again in the future with a downturn. My, um, any suggestions how an investor can respond to this if they happen in the, in the near future that um, gold and other mining stocks end up going down with the rest of the stock market? The, the, my history says and research that the best boom for gold stocks is actually a strong stock market and gold prices. So gold stocks will correlate and royalties included 92, 94% of the time with bullion, almost on a daily basis, that name moves up and down with uh, the daily volatility and the trend of gold. If you have a bearish stock market, those gold stocks just don't perform. They don't, they're, they're, they languish. Uh, and if you go back to 2001 to 2007, we had a, a great gold run, gold uh, uh, more than doubled, and gold and stocks as a whole also more than doubled. And so therefore, the gold stocks went up fivefold, sixfold, eightfold. Uh, and so you need both engines. It, it's, they're not exclusive. They're very important at how they're connected. Do I believe we're going to be in a bullish stock market? Yes, I do, because of the all these central banks and governments all of a sudden playing the stock market. It's best that the stock market it does well. Uh, and we also have President Trump. He's the only president in America that looks in the mirror every day at his hair, and then he turns around and checks the stock market. It, 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 no, one's, no president's ever done that, and he's very aware that the stock market is a precursor to economic growth six months old. It's a leading indicator. So I think that uh, you're gonna be long the stock market in a zero interest rate environment. 
uh, dividend paying stocks are even more attractive and royalty companies, the new monster ferrets, they're all increasing and the mid cap ones are increasing their dividends. So they're becoming much more appealing. So I think we're in a secular bull market for gold stocks. The other one I share with you is this free cash flow and the free cash flow yield. You're hearing more big mining companies talk about it. Uh, and if you look at the first quarter of this year, uh, the S&P used to have at the end of December, two and a half percent was free cash flow yield. That's gone, gone, but not for Newmont. Newmont turned around and expanded their free cash flow and became the best performing stock. Well, it wasn't because of new gold investors jumping in for that. That was predominantly the generalists who follow those metrics. So if we look at three years, we look at 10 years, uh, that free cash flow attracts the generalists and if you have gold rising, which I think is going to happen, and zero interest rates are going to stay for a while, then the stock market is going to be a buoyant place to be. Gold stocks are going to be on a huge run, and we're going to get the small caps and new royalty companies coming on the stream with the with the concept that you have here. I, I think are very going to be very exciting opportunities over the next three years. Thank you, Frank. Joe, do you have anything to add? Oh, I think Joe message saying his connection wasn't good. I think we may have lost Joe. Um, I will go on to the next question. Um, this one is um, non-mining related, but it is for Frank. Frank, is that a three gene roll piece for your red dinosaur? Yes, it is. And what's interesting about it is that T-Rex Red was really a political statement that the, um, the Chinese government, uh, and not the Chinese people, but the sort of the emperor and the small communist party, of the, they're, they're T-Rexes. But you couldn't say that without getting spanked by the government. So art became the form of talking about politics. So that is more of a... Uh, uh, of the Communist Party uh, are a bunch of red T-Rexes. <laughs> <laughs> There's 1,000 of them made. And, and interesting for trivia is the box, I have the original, that's why it's in plastic, it's, it's in a special case, is the box is now worth more than what I paid for my T-Rex because <laughs> it's a professional box. And there was only 1,000 made. And I think like most people threw out the box not realizing it, uh, but they've both gone up in value. And so when someone comes in to clean my office, I don't want them banging my box or my dinosaur. So that's why I haven't cased with uh, uh, a plastic case. Very nice. Yes, one of our, our attendees kind of noticed that. So she was wondering. Um, next question is, um, all royalties and streaming companies have a unique ability to generate revenue, um, both in rising and falling markets. Um, it, can you expand on that, Frank, on how, what that says about um, their attractiveness versus um, other models in the gold space? Well, I, I think uh, when you step outside of that, that model, the model is a very unique business model. And as Warren Buffett uh, says that if the business has a moat around it, then it becomes more attractive. Two, you, the, it's hard to turn around and take that asset away. You can't really compete against it. The other part is recurring revenue. And any business that has a stream of recurring revenue and is consistent gets a much higher valuation. Microsoft used to always do big ads and a campaign for their new uh, software, and now it's all recurring revenue. It's a SaaS model. And quickly they went from 50 billion to over 150 billion of cash in their balance sheet. Uh, and, and their stock price started to appreciate with that. So I think it's important to recognize that model. Now, when you step away from that model and you're going to go to junior mining stocks or say mid cap producers. So we've done this regressional work down to a hundred million dollar market cap up to a billion and only by those stocks where the revenue for the last quarter is above four quarters, and only by those stocks where the cash flow for the last quarter is above four quarters, and they have a free cash flow yield, 
they crushed it. In the past year, I think they were up 80%. So who's buying them? When I talk to uh, the, the uh, analysts, uh, the gold fund analysts and from brokerage firms, et cetera, they don't use that narrative. Who buys them are the quant funds and the generalists that say they always buy these free cash flow and that momentum of revenue. Uh, and, and so the other fact is that most of the forecast by production is going to go up or go down is irrelevant because 92% of the time they're wrong. Barry Cooper's done this research years ago at CIBC. So that is not a good tool. It's basically this past quarter over four quarters, this past year over three years on a per share basis. If the top line and bottom line are growing, those stocks get money going into them. And I think that that's how investors should take a look at micro cap stocks and small caps, $200 million. Are they showing that revenue and cash flow growth? Thank you, Frank. Um, a question for Joe. Um, you cover a lot of your a lot of the companies that you're covering on your newsletter um, are exploration companies. How? What would you say is the ratio um, of the companies that you may be invested in or following between uh, profit generation or exploration versus royalty companies? Versus royalty companies, uh, I've only got one royalty company. If we call Evram a royalty company, which I don't, uh, I would uh, I, I, I'd still only have two out of twenty. Uh, most of what I do is try to pick up the companies that hopefully find something. The discovery premium about finding a new deposit—that's really the the five bagger or what have you. Uh, I don't need liquidity. Uh, uh, like, a, like a big fund needs uh, or anything like that. Neither do most of my subscribers. So what we're looking for is to uh, de-risk that part about the management team, the, the geology of that, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to pick those kind of companies. What I would say about Evram, uh, which is similar to some prospect generators I owned or have owned, is the generation of royalties is something that are all the royalty companies cannot do they purchase royalties, they don't generate them. So if you can actually generate a portfolio of royalties by actually doing expiration and then giving it to somebody else, slowly you accumulate a critical mass of royalties that not necessarily, they don't need to be cash flowing for somebody to bid on them. And even more so now, now that the population of royalty companies is, uh, has gone up. So if they, people can see that it's about to cash flow or it's owned by a big company, suddenly that, uh, that uh, royalty that you have that you might not see a, a single dollar come out of for five to 10 years has value that uh, maybe the market doesn't appreciate in your portfolio, but the royalty companies definitely do. And when royalty companies buy portfolios uh, or even buy royalties from smaller companies, what they're hoping for is that asset gets bought again and again and again and again until it gets into the hands of a major company and then that royalty suddenly has a lot more uh, a bigger premium and is more important what they don't want is a royalty continually owned by a junior miner that's a hand to mouth respect to capital and can't develop the asset well and that's something like what happened to sandstorm when yamana was holding uh, uh, the chapada deposit and sandstorm had a stream on the copper once Lundin got in there, they recapitalized that project, which was great for Sandstorm, and Sandstorm didn't have to put a cent into it. You know, years ago, um, and it's still relevant, did a simple algorithm. And, uh, and so the, the most famous algorithm is E is equal to MC squared. Uh, for a simple term of understanding, and it was taking a, a basket of junior explorers and it was, they had to have $300,000 in cash, plus they had to have reserves, and you divide it by the number of shares. So if they raised money, you would treat the reserve the same as the cash, so there's a greater value. But a year later, or the quarter later, if the cash went down, there's no increase in reserves, you sold them. So they had to basically protect the growth in reserves per share. And a basket of 50 of these names outperform. They far outperform the Vancouver Stock Exchange Index, 
however, you couldn't really deploy much more than $10 million because you would move the market and you could never get that performance number. So it's so attractive for uh, a newsletter writer like what Joe's doing of having a basket of these names. And, and the biggest factor is that reserves per share are growing. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're inferred because we found that they're the biggest, they always bounce back the most uh, in a resurgence of confidence in junior exploration. Those companies that have the most reserves on their balance sheet bounce back. Otherwise, you have to bet on the jockey. You're not buying the horse, you're buying the jockey. And the jockey has a track record. And uh, and jockey has created wealth uh, several times by demonstrating them. The difficult part in, in say, when you talk about gold producers and mutual funds, well, there's 100 global gold producers. And it's very hard to find 20 superstar CEOs. And the reason why I say that is because you have to have at least 20 stocks to have a mutual fund. So you, you have to, you have a difficulty basically for regulatory concerns of liquidity and diversification, et cetera. But when you're a newsletter writer, I think what Joe is talking about is that he can basically hone in on great jockeys. And if he can tell me a story that's on five great jockeys, then I'm going to want to know more about them, about their projects, because they always, wherever they go, like LeBron, uh, they go from one team to the next, they have championships. They're, they're the jockeys. So that's the magic of it. Would you agree, Joe? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, uh, it is about the people, especially when you uh, were talking about the high risk, high reward end of it. Mm -hmm. Because as easily as, not easily, but as, as you could make five times your money, you could also lose all of it. So it's not for everybody uh, in terms of, uh, uh, but what we're seeing now is because uh, there's a lot more uh, retail investors in the market and potentially people that uh, have never invested in this, um, in this industry before, is uh, we're seeing a lot of companies, again, like we saw maybe seven, eight years ago that have no resources that are trading at market caps back over 500 million. And the idea almost with some of these is never to have a resource and always to show that eternal dream, the upside without actually quantifying something that somebody would have to actually put a number around. Uh, you know, infinity is easier. Uh, so uh, there's a lot more of that, but that kind of valuation requires a much bullish market, which, which we have right now. Thank you. And the last question is for Patty. Um, Patty, you mentioned that um, regarding the merger, what are the next uh, pieces of news or development in this new emerged company that um, investors can look out for in the next few months or next year that will move the stock, do you think? Um, uh, good question. I, I think there's sort of three key areas that, that we need to look look at when when once we've got the, the merger complete and, and we start uh, trading as origin, which I expect it to be around the end of August, early September. And, and one of the key features is going to be providing proof of concept that, that we can execute on our business model. So adding royalties to the portfolio is going to be key. And that comes from both the, the you know, um, acquisition side of the business and, and also through um, generating our, our, our royalties uh, organically. So that, that, that's going to be key. Um, and then number two, obviously, it's, it's the projects that we already have uh, either under option to exploration uh, companies or sorry, mining companies out there already, along with um, projects that we already have royalties on today, or our own generative efforts is, is discovery, exploration discovery. And, and that in itself is, is the single biggest form of value creation you can possibly have. And so, you know, if those happen, um, you know, there should be a marked increase in, in, in our share price, but you don't know when those come. Those are a little harder to ascertain, but the more uh, joint ventures you have, uh, the, the greater your opportunity to, to uh, you know, have that discovery, obviously. So that, that's important. Um, you know, we do have, as I said, we do have other royalties that, that exist. And if there's a discovery made on those projects, well, then there, there's a possibly a shorter term uh, value creation there. Uh, but but that, that's one of the key ones. And obviously the third one 
is the um, changes on our crystallized royalties where we have deposits. And so the Irmitano deposit is slated for production in 2021. The operating group there is First Majestic Silver. The deposit sits uh, about four kilometers from the Santa Elena mill. And today it's sort of global resources are somewhere in the range of 800,000 ounces gold. And so that has a um, long mine life to it, probably eight to 10 years. Um, the ground that, that the deposit sits within the Ermitano project is quite large, it's 220 square kilometers of ground. And so the opportunity to find more resources I think is there, but, but as we near production on Ermitano, the risk will drop and obviously that the value should come up. And you know, the one thing I, I do want to point out is silicon is, is the you know, dark horse, it's a bit of an unknown. Anglo Gold Ashanti has been uh, very busy there for the past number of years, and I expect they're going to have a busy season drilling there this year. They have not announced results, um, and their CEO on a number of occasions has, has indicated that those results will come at some point, and so we're, uh, we're eagerly expecting those, and, and those two events in, in their own right should have significant, significant impact on, on the value of, of origin. Thank you, Patty. Um, and with that, we are at an hour, five minutes past the hour, so we will end the webcast here. Um, if we receive more questions from anybody attending or watching this recording, uh, please send them over to myself, Liliana W. at everresources.com, or um, we'll put them up on quorum2020.com. The website will be there for them. The next in the next week and um, you can leave your comments there and we will pass questions to our panel speakers and our keynote speaker Frank um, thank you so much Frank and so for joining us thanks guys and have a good day